Thank you so much for coming today. Um, my name is Florian Andres. Uh, I'm a PhD student in the Department uh, for Comparative Literature, and I'm the organizer of this year's departmental lecture series. Before we start, I want uh, to thank my department, most of all Valerie Kanka, um, for putting this event together, and also the Humanities Council and the German Department for their uh, generous co-sponsorship. For those of you who have missed our previous events, this year's series is titled Universality and its Glitches. It consists of a total of seven lectures that interrogate the past and actuality, the pitfalls and emancipatory dimensions of a concept that seems to be helplessly out of fashion today, universality. All of our speakers who work in a variety of fields ranging from philosophy, psychoanalysis, media studies, and literature argue against the grain of what seems today's default position, at least in the world of critical scholarship, namely the wholesale critique of the concept due to its imminent exclusions, if not the outright claim of the impossibility of any emphatic notion of universality. All of the speakers do so uh, not only by means of their rigorous academic work, they also do so as engaged intellectuals that don't shy away from public interventions which go beyond the comfort of the university system. I'm particularly excited to welcome a speaker who needs a little introduction. I mean, the turnout of tonight um, is kind of a proof enough, I think. But uh, just for the sake of formality and for the big other, I'll do it anyway. Slavo Žižek is a senior researcher at the Institute for Sociology and Philosophy at the University of Ljubljana, global distinguished professor of German at New York University, and international director of the Birkbeck Institute for Humanities in London. He is a Hegelian philosopher, a Lacanian psychoanalytic theorist, a Marxist social analyst, globally known for his sharp interventions in public debates, unorthodox pop cultural commentary, and not least for giving jokes their full philosophical power. In doing so, Slavoj Žižek participates, uh, practices what, one's, what one could call, in reference to Hegel, a concrete universality, that is, by confronting a universality with its unbearable examples, by creating short circuits that mark the symptoms of our symbolic universe. Slavoj's numerous books include, just to mention three uh, out of the many that there are, um, The Parallax View from 2009, Less Than Nothing, Hegel and the Shadow of Dialectical Materialism uh, from 2013, and most recently, Surplus Enjoyment, A Guide for the Non-Perplexed. The lecture that Professor Zizek will present today is titled Unbehagen in der Natur, On Thinking the End of Nature. There will be time, maybe, hopefully, for a Q&A after the session. Uh, but for now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Zizek. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, I'm glad to be here again, almost at least a quarter of a century ago. I was here with Ed, and I have good memories from that time, and so on. And, and uh, I hope, just hope you will not be disappointed. Usually, the title of my talk has absolutely nothing to do with what I, with the topic of the talk. This today, I decided to give a very traditional talk systematically about this topic and. Uh, and please don't expect, I almost feel ashamed. I'm used to get interrupted to say something problematic about LGBT plus and so on, saying all the things wrong you know. I, I renounce that today. Don't be disappointed. Uh, although I'm so sad I cannot afford a short introduction, improvisation, not to be able to go into this uh, a new conflict, uh, transgender seas, and so on, all that stuff, because the more I think about it, the more I am tempted to oppose both sides. That is to say, on the one hand, of course, those who think, uh, I even don't know how to call it. I'm, for theoretical reasons, opposed to the term gender. I think se in sex, you have a certain antagonism which remains there, but okay, why do I oppose both sides? On the one hand, those who preach, uh, like those who think sex is, sexual identity is basically uh, biologically determined, 
I noticed, I wonder if you noticed it, an obvious paradox in consistency. People who advocate that uh, sex identity is biologically determined are terribly afraid of uh, LGBT open education. You know, when in kindergarten and schools you are attentive to, you want to make to the small child visible, uh, palpable, that there are other options, not just what appears to be his, her, it's their, uh, their uh, biological uh, sex. But then, if they believe in, uh, in uh, biological, more or less, determinism, why are they so afraid of LGBT plus propaganda? I think their secret belief is that they can be easily denaturalized, which means that they really believe even too much that sex is a sexual construct, you know? And then you can like overturn it with, on the other hand, those, what I oppose on the opposite side, it's not, of course not, LGBT as such, is just, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe if you'll be, you will be too bored with nature, we can uh, go into a debate later in this direction. Like, uh, I think the choice between, on the one hand, your, what appears as biological, sexual identity, and what you, the term that is always used or regularly used, I don't like it, is that, that you should be free to decide to declare what you feel. Sorry, but for me, my greatest reproach to a certain LGBT plus ideology, which is we are free to choose, blah, blah, uh, construct, reconstruct ourselves, is that it makes it too easy too easy in the sense, in what sense? In the sense that many, no wonder, many uh, LGBT plus, some, some of are very bright. Uh, people, they uh, hate psychoanalysis. It's patriarchal, binary, all you want. But I think precisely the trans topic makes it clear how traumatic, inconsistent subjectivity is. Like, you can feel one thing, you are substantially another thing. Uh, did you see, I forgot the title, there was a Belgian movie, fiction, but based on a real case about a boy who wants to become a girl. And with great support from his, her, uh, colleagues, doctors, parents, even. She does it, but it involves so many traumas. You know, so, okay, let's not get lost. We have nature to deal with, but my point is this one. Yes, I agree. Your sexual identity is a matter of, in some deep sense of free choice. But the notion of freedom here is very radical. Let me mention a simple case. Let's say you are biologically, you appear as a man, you want to become whatever you want, let's say to simplify a woman. But you know, this is not like going to a patisserie and say, sorry, yes, till yesterday I was eating cheesecake, now I want strawberry cake. It's something very traumatic, which involves a lot of even physical suffering, surgery, traumas, and so on. So the freedom we are dealing here, it's not a simple freedom of choice. It's really something like unconscious choice. And I more and more think that the big contribution of Freud to theory of choice is that in our unconscious, we are much more free than in our conscious self awareness. The, the most radical choices, we experience them as necessity. The true choice is when you feel about something, I can't do it otherwise. Although it's my free choice, but radical freedom appears as fake, if you want. And all these things are so complicated. I don't know if you know it, something happened. It was a big trauma in my, as your beloved president X. Maybe future Trump put it, shithole of a country, Slovenia. Uh, 
Uh, there was a really tragic hate. My wife knew that boy, girl. Uh, a young, uh, young, already student, okay, early 20s. Boy successfully became a woman. He went through all the surgery, blah, blah, blah. No problems, parents accepted it, friends, blah, blah. Then something happened. On a certain day, she, now she, got official letter from, uh, from city authorities where you are registered as a citizen that she is now officially a woman. She killed herself instantly. You see how it, uh, apparently totally external thing, like how it's registered by the big other of state institution ruined everything. So the way, the reason I think Freud can still tell us a lot, Freud and today's Freudians, precisely about transgender identity. I think that they are the most free people, but they pay a price for it, great price. And that's where they need not our patronizing support, but uh, 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 how to put it? You know, when we have this uh, polemics about how uh, sexual identity should be playful, like today I'm gay, tomorrow I'm hetero, then I play another game, and so on, doesn't, isn't something, uh, how to put it, uh, uh, patronizingly humiliating in this? All, all, it somehow ignores the deep personal traumas, complexities, and even, I would have put it, the real profound suffering of changing your sexual identity. That's the, that's the problem. And I think, again, psychoanalysis has a role to play here. But enough of this. Let me begin. I want to, you know what's my ideal? I did it once in Belgrade, I think. I went on and on with introductions so that for one hour and a half and there was no talk. <laughs> Just introductions, I, I loved it. Only one thing I loved more, there has to be a dirty joke before I begin. Uh, 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 my friend, Alain Badiou, now for political misunderstanding, no longer such a great friend, uh, uh, did this to me. We were in a room like this, I was giving a talk, he sat like you, Andrew, in the first row, and his phone rang. And he answered it calmly, I went on with my talk, and he told me, while I was giving a talk to 100 people, Slavo, you are a little bit too loud. In this. Can you please speak a little bit less loudly? That's my big dream is a different one, that I give a talk, then that's why I left it in my luggage there. Then uh, my phone rings, and I keep it up and ask you, just wait a minute, and then talk calmly with my friend. But you know, not about theory, about this, oh, is that restaurant really so good? Shouldn't we pick up another restaurant? And so that's my dream, but dreams don't come true. OK, <laughs> let me begin with serious stuff. I began with these jokes because, again, it's uh, problematic for some of you, or I hope, but serious stuff that I want to do. I want to begin with the paradox of superego, long ago noted by Freud. The more we obey the superego commandment, the more we feel guilty. That's the basic paradox of superego. You know, the more you obey, the more you are guilty. This paradox holds also when we follow Lacan and read superego as an injunction to enjoy. Enjoyment is an impossible real. You cannot ever fully attain it, and this failure makes us feel guilty. A series of situations that characterize today's society exemplify perfectly this type of superego logic. Ecology, political correctness, poverty, up to indebtedness in general. For example, and the example is nature, ecology. Does the predominant ecological discourse not address us as a priori guilty, indebted to mother nature, 
under the constant pressure of the ecological superego agency which addresses us in our individuality. What did you do today to repay your debt to nature? Did you put all newspapers into a proper recycle bin? And all the bottles of beer or cans of Coke? Did you use your car where you could or should have used a bike or some means of public transport? Did you use air conditioning instead of just opening wide the windows and so on? The ideological, I think we should reject this logic, the ideological stakes of such individualization are easily discernible. I get lost in my own self-examination instead of raising much more pertinent global questions about our entire industrial civilization. This is why it is in a way quite justified that I feel guilty. Following the injunctions to recycle and so on ultimately means that I follow rituals which allow me to postpone doing something that would really address the causes of ecological crisis. Let me go even a step further here. The burning of the Amazon forests cannot but trigger alarm. Are we really heading towards a collective suicide? By destroying the Amazon rainforests, Brazilians are, so we are told, killing the lungs of our earth. However, if we want to confront seriously threats to our environment, uh, uh, what we should avoid are precisely such quick extrapolations which fascinate our imagination. I remember when first there was a talk some at least 30 years ago in Germany especially about Waldsterben, the dying of forests. It was global fascination in the media. Like uh, the idea was, and they were obvious, that around 2000, at least 2000 then, Europe will be without forests and so on and so on. Now, according to some data, which are to be taken seriously, on our Earth there are more forests than at any point in the 20th century on our Earth. Now, let me be uh, precise here. I'm not saying ecological crisis is not to be taken seriously. It's mega serious. I'm just saying that this fascination with catastrophe, which immobilizes you, is one of the ways to avoid really confronting the crisis. How we avoid it? Precisely by uh, surrendering to this fear. Ecology of fear, I think, has all the chances of developing into the predominant form of ideology of global capitalism, a new opium for the masses, replacing the declining religion. The rejection of anthropocentrism advocated by deep ecologists is very suspicious. There is a deep hypocrisy in it. What all the talk about how we, humanity, pose a threat to the life on and of the earth really amounts to is our, it's our worry about our own fate. Earth in itself is indifferent. Even if we destroy life on it, it will just be one, not even the greatest of catastrophes that befell it. When we worry about environment, we really worry about our own environment. We want our own good and safe life. So even when we profess the readiness to assume our responsibility for ecological catastrophes, this can be a tricky stratagem to avoid the true dimensions of the threat. There is something deceptively reassuring in this readiness to assume the guilt for the threats to our environment. We like to be guilty since if we are guilty, then it all depends on us. We pull the strings of the catastrophe so we can also save ourselves simply by changing our lives. What is really difficult for us to accept is that we are reduced to a passive role of an impotent observer who can only sit and watch what his fate will be. To avoid such a situation, we are prone to engage in frantic obsessive 
rituals. Recycle old paper, buy organic food, whatever, just so that you can be sure that we are doing something, making our contribution. I think some ecologists often act like a soccer fan who supports his team in front of a TV screen at home, shouting and jumping from his seat as if acting in a superstitious belief that this will somehow influence uh, the outcome. There is another dimension I developed this in my books repeatedly, where I distrust common ecology. If you look at it closely, it's often, it's often this predominant ecology. It's really not about doing something for nature, but making us feel good to be part of a large ideological project of saving Earth and so on, uh, and so on. This is my, I often repeat it, maybe you know it, provocative point. Some of my friends like to buy those half-rotten organic apples <laughs> and not the beautiful genetically manipulated ones. <laughs> but then I, some of them were open enough towards me. I asked them, do you really believe that that half-rotten apple is any better? Because my dream is that, you know, a farmer takes the nice apples out, then the, what remains, the half-rotten apples, he sells them at a double price as uh, <laughs> organic. And you know what most of them tell me? They tell me, uh, I know, I have doubts, but it makes me feel good that I'm doing something for Mother Nature. Don't underestimate this, don't underestimate this dimension. Let me go on. Ah, another thing. Did you notice how uh, capitalism itself made out of being green uh, a new market niche? That's an old example of mine. Maybe some of you know it, but it's still my favorite. Now, it's no, no, no longer to such an extent present. In Starbucks, at least 10, 15 years ago, it was all about green. They, they claimed, for example, openly manipulating us. Our true, our cappuccino is 10 cents more expensive than down the street. But 2% of all that we earn goes to some uh, starving children in Somalia, forests in I don't know where. And this is an ingenious trick. Why? Because uh, usually we are split as consumer. I buy all the decadent stuff, but then I feel bad, I try to do something for common welfare. But here, this is for me the final step of the commodity logic. You include your social responsibility into the price of the commodity. It's like, I don't know, $1.50. Now it's higher, I think. Cappuccino and then 20 cents, so you can stay calm and so on and so on. Let me not get lost in this direction, let me go on. Today, ecology tends to perceive nature itself as the limit of our expansion. It enjoins us, humans, to renounce our hubris, our ruthless exploitation of nature. Now that God or tradition can no longer play the role of the highest limit, nature takes over this role. But what kind of nature will this be? Even when we imagine global warming, we still picture the, the outcome of global warming as a new stability with regular, repeatable weather patterns. However, recent researches find it more probable that Earth's climate leads to a chaos, true mathematical chaos, in which there is no equilibrium, no repeatable patterns. A chaotic climate would have seasons that change wildly from decade to decade, or even year to year. Some years would experience sudden flashes of extreme weather, while others would be completely quiet. Such an outcome is not only catastrophic for our survival, it also runs against our most basic notion of nature, that of repeatable pattern of seasons. 
As such, it reminds us, or me at least, of what the great Marxist, Gert Lukacs, in his classical book, History and Class Consciousness, pointed out. Nature is a social category. That is to say, what we perceive as nature is always overdetermined by a social contact. So while, of course, everything there is is nature, we are part of nature, the obverse also holds at the level of our understanding. Nature is a cultural category. What strikes us as unnatural is always socially determined. In are we entering a post-atropocentric era? A BBC report on the 2022 Venice Biennale, we read that its curator, Cecilia Alemani, and incidentally, if there is a thing I really hate, they are the worst of today's ideology, I think, are these art biennales. <laughs> because it's a crazy gap between how an institution actually functions and its ideological legitimization. Did you notice how to appear at a Biennale, you should always this uh, 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 programmatic manifestos are utterly anti-capitalist. We are racist, colonialist still, we are destroying nature, we are exploiting Africa. Whatever you want, everything is there, and they even usually include themselves, like even our machine is, our machine, uh, uh, our biennale is part of the capital self-reproduction, but it goes on. I mean, nothing changes. Obviously, today we are at an extremely cynical uh, 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 stage of the functioning of ideology. And I'm tempted, but I developed this elsewhere, to go on to the end. It's not only that it doesn't matter if you criticize the ruling ideology, the system goes on. It is that in some deeper sense, criticizing it makes the system function all the better. Okay, let's go on. What this lady, Cecilia Alemani, said. She tries to, quote, imagine a world where humans are not at the top of the pyramid. They live in a more horizontal relationship, not only with each other, but also with nature and animals, with organic and non-organic beings. To be tastelessly aggressive, when I hear such a line, I have this Joseph Goebbels reaction. I draw my gun. Why? The least one can say is that such a post-anthropocentric vision of a horizontal relationship between humans, living beings, and non-organic entities is only accessible to us humans. Non-organic entities are simply part of their environment, while animals and plants uh, relate to it from their narrow perspective. They cannot imagine a global natural order, a small, small part of which they are. You see my point. It's in Lacanian terms, but also I can put it in Hegelian terms, the distinction between what you say, enunciated content, and position of enunciation. Yet it's nice to say, I'm just one of the species, part of nature, blah, blah, blah. But how can you say this? Isn't it that you somehow presume that you are able to stand on your shoulders and have a global, abstract look at the reality where you are just one among the species? So, uh, species. So, horizontal texture of beings is no less anthropocentric than a pyramidal one. This is why it is not enough to repeat that we are a part of nature, that we are not its center. Uh, so, that we should develop new solidarity and accept our modest place in the life on our earth. Let me quote here Judith Butler, with whom I respectfully disagree here. And, Inhabitable world for humans depends on a flourishing earth that does not have humans at its center. We oppose environmental toxins, not only so that we humans can live and breathe without fear, 
of being poisoned, but also because the water and the air must have lives that are not centered on our own. As we dismantle the rigid forms of individuality in these interconnected times, we can imagine the smaller part that human worlds must play on this earth whose regeneration we depend upon and which in turn depends upon our smaller and more mindful role." End of quote. I think that it is all too simple to insist that the water and the air must have lives that are not centered on our own. Is it not that? But I think effectively the opposite is true. Global warming and other ecological threats demand our, our collective interventions into environment, which will be incredibly powerful, direct interventions into the fragile balance of forms of life. When we say that the rise of average temperature has to be kept below and this magic number always oscillates. It's 1.5 Celsius, it's 2 Celsius degrees. We talk and try to act as general managers of life on Earth, not as a modest species. The regeneration of the Earth obviously does not depend upon our smaller and more mindful role. It depends upon our gigantic role, which is the truth beneath all the talk about our finitude and mortality. What we get here is the extreme form of the gap at work already in modern science and subjectivity. Modern science aims at mastering nature, but it is strictly codependent with the vision of humanity as just another species on the earth. This is the paradox we have to sustain in these crazy days. To accept that we are one among the species on Earth and simultaneously to think and act as universal beings. Don't even ecologists admit this when they say uh, we have to keep the balance of our environment. Again, they speak from a universal position. They speak in an, if you want, extremely arrogant uh, in an extremely arrogant mode. And this gap between what we talk about and the subjective position involved in our saying and acting is, I think, uh, crucial. I'm usually very critical of, small detour, of Hannah Arendt. But uh, in her short text on education, she says something wonderful, which I think is also the proper answer to all those who, neurobiologists and so on, who claim, sorry, it can be proven, it can be, it's more complex, but it can be proven that all our acts are, are uh, biologically, neurally, and so on, determined. But you know what's the problem here? As a Hegelian with whom I'm often in polemics, but he is not a total idiot. Uh, no, I'm not patronizing him. There are only two types of people, total idiots and not total idiots. Uh, <laughs> God is maybe, but there is no God up there. <laughs> not an idiot. Okay, what Pippin says is that we should ask the question, what to do in a concrete situation when you have to act. Can you say, why should, uh, let, let's say, pathet it's a pathetic case, but sorry. You see, oh my God, so pathetic. A small, nice girl, a child drowning in a swimming pool or whatever. Now, uh, I don't think you will say, what the hell, why should I worry? I'm predetermined. My neuronal nature will speak and so on. You, uh, you should act as if you are free. And uh, here things get complex because you still, if you are a radical neurobiologist, you can say, yes, this is called uh, user's illusion. But again, it gets more complex, and here I come to Hannah Arendt. Uh, even, ah, this is what explains another paradox. That's why in theological matters, I absolutely prefer Protestantism. 
Did you notice this basic paradox of Protestantism? I simplify things very much, but on the one hand, Protestantism preaches predetermination. Everything is predetermined by God. If we are saved or lost, uh, it's predetermined before even the creation of the world. But the trick is that you don't know how you are predetermined. That's why uh, uh, Protestant predestination doesn't allow you to just sit down, watch hardcore pornography, whatever, and say, I don't care, everything is pre No, you are, you are, and this is, I think that this is the closest we can come to true freedom. True freedom is not, oh, I'm in a strawberry, again, my old example, I'm in a patisserie, oh, I'm now free to decide, strawberry cake or cheesecake, no. True freedom is, I know I'm predetermined, but I don't know how. So I worry, what if by mistake I miss what I am predetermined to do? <laughs> this crazy situation where what if I miss the, uh, what if I miss the, uh, the uh, necessity? And yes, back to Hannah Arendt, it's such a simple but deeply true observation. She writes in that short text on education that our uh, common uh, situation as parents where today, who knows what will happen, war, hunger, chaos, and if a small kid, son, she, she, or it, I'm correct, I would like to be it, not they, as they are now, trans, you know, because in my language it's extremely ridiculous. They is still used in Slovene, but as this extremely flattering case, like if you are with a mega authority, you ask him, what would they like me? And it's simply, but okay. What I want to say is that, let's say a child asks you, father, what's happening, what's going on? I'm confused, I don't know, how will I survive? And wouldn't the only honest answer be to say, what do I know, what the hell? I'm also in a total mess, sorry guy, you are on your own, do it. <laughs> It's totally true, but at the level of your subjectivity, it's a fake. So isn't this a beautiful paradox where, although it's true that you as a parent don't have this all-encompassing knowledge, you have heroically assumed it. Although you know it's a lie, and now I don't have time to go into it, this is not the same as the cynical approach advocated by some Lacanians, unfortunately, today, which is uh, 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 pretend, pretend that authority is authentic and so on, because otherwise there will be chaos. No, it's something, it's that you have to lie, lie in the sense of acting with authority that you don't have, but you have to lie as the only ethical ethical way uh, uh, left to you. So uh, let's go on. The temptation to be resisted here is to continue to rely on our basic uh, notion of nature and proclaim chaos as somehow unnatural. You see, this is the true anthropocentrism for, for me. When you look at chaotic nature, uh, uh, trees burning, blah, 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 and say, this is not natural. No, sorry, not, nature is unnatural. Everything is unnatural. What do I mean by this? Please, if you want to read a really good science fiction novel, uh, uh, read Liu Cixin's contemporary Chinese author, he's in trouble now, of course, politically. Did, maybe you read it, The Three-Body Problem, about a, a planet far away from Earth called Trisolaris, which has three suns, which rise and set at strange, unpredictable intervals. Uh, so that the, 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 the dev devastating hurricanes, droughts, floods, and so on, uh, that's the that's the state of things there. And I think maybe this is what we are approaching. We are thus, I claim, entering a new phase in which it is simply nature itself 
which melts into thin air. The main consequence also of the scientific breakthroughs in biogenetics is the end of nature. Once you know the rules of the construction of natural objects, natural organisms are transformed into objects amenable to manipulation. And I think we should accept this. This is why now I come to the lowest of my guilty pleasures. It, was, it wanted to be a big hit, but it failed. But I somehow enjoy it. You probably, if you've seen it, hate it. Did you see uh, Roland Emmerich's last movie, Moonfall? It's horror. But you know what I like about it? The premise of the movie is that our moon is an artificial megastructure constructed by the ancestors of humanity. The plot of the movie is that moon is approaching Earth, and we send very easily, a couple of hundred of miles, astronauts there, they discover a hole in, on the moon, they enter it, and it's a beautiful description of how on the outside moon is chaotic, rugged terrain. The more you go in, the more you see machinery and so on and so on. I think that, uh, I think that uh, this is what is happening, that, uh, uh, that what people claim the end of humanity, the post-human era, where we will be able through biogenetic and other technologies to manipulate our mind will also mean the end of nature. Uh, nature, human and inhuman, is deprived of its impenetrable density. This compels us to give a new twist to Freud's title, Unbehagen in der Kultur, discontent, uneasiness in culture. With the latest development, scientific developments, the discontent shifts from culture to nature itself. Nature is no longer natural, the reliable, dense background of our lives. It appears as a fragile mechanism which, at any point, can explode into a, a, into a catastrophic uh, dimension. This is why, again, while there are three, four, five modes of what I call false ideological ecology. For example, it's easy to enumerate them. The first one is simple ignorance. Uh, ecological troubles are a marginal phenomenon. Life goes on, nature will take care of itself. Then the next deviation, science and technology can save us. Just trust science. The next one, leave the solution to the market higher taxation of the polluters, and so on. Then, the already mentioned superego pressure, you are personally responsible, and so on. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> sorry, just friendly gesture. And then, five, the worst of them all, the advocating of a return to natural balance, to become respectful children of our mother nature. But I, think that this is such a dangerous mythology, this, you know, that this is the most dangerous anthropocentrism. This idea, nature in itself follows some kind of a homeostatic balance, natural patterns, and then we humans with our hubris derail the natural uh, rhythm. Uh, but just think about the fact that our main sources of energy still today, oil, coal, are remnants of past catastrophes which occurred prior to the advent of humanity. And we are the outcome of these catastrophes. Every, every, uh, every good historian of our Earth will tell you that without that mega catastrophe, you know, which destroyed all uh, dinosaurs and so on, there would have been no humans on our Earth. So, uh, you know, like, uh, yes, there is mother nature, but it's a cold and cruel bitch, to cut a long story short. <laughs> but this in no way entails that we should relax and trust our future. So what is to be done? 
We are in deep mess. I just want to present you with problems. There is no simple democratic solution here. The idea that people themselves, not just governments and corporations, should decide what to do sounds deep, but it begs an important question. Even if the comprehension of scientists is not distorted by corporate interests, what qualifies them to pass a judgment in such a delicate, delicate matter? And we, ordinary people, have to rely on scientists. Plus, the radical measures advocated by some ecologists can themselves trigger new catastrophes. Let me take the idea of solar radiation management, the continuous massive dispersals of aerosols into our atmosphere to reflect and absorb sunlight and thus cool our planet. However, uh, 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 this uh, 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 SRM is extremely risky. It could decrease drop yields, irreparably al alter the water cycle, and so on and so on. We cannot even imagine how the fragile balance of our Earth functions. This continuously confronts us with the deadlock of the contemporary society of choice. In the standard situation of the first choice, I'm free to choose on condition that I make the right choice. So that the only thing left to me is to do the empty gesture, pretending to accomplish freely what is in any case imposed on me. And this mechanism is not necessarily totalitarian. I think that uh, our entire social identity is constructed in this way. There is a free choice, but you are given the freedom to choose if you make the right choice. And I will repeat now, sorry if some of you know it, one of my favorite old stories, it happened to a friend of mine when he was serving 40 years ago in the Yugoslav army, that after two weeks of introductory training, you had the big moment. All the soldiers were gathered in a big field. You repeated the oath, and then each of us has to sign his agreement, like I'm ready to sacrifice my life to defend my country, blah, blah. And the friend of mine did something breathtaking. He confronted the officer and says, am I obliged to sign this, or do I have a free choice? And the officer told him, of course, you have a free choice, because otherwise, it wouldn't oblige you. And the, uh, my friend said, OK, then I, I, I refuse to choose. And uh, the officer started to shout at him, would like to be arrested, blah, blah. And after five, 10 minutes of conflict, the officer, who was rather a stupid guy, I think, uh, proposed this solution. And my friend still has this paper. It's on, on his wall as the most his most precious document, the officer wrote to him a piece of paper ordering him to freely sign <laughs> the oath. This is not some totalitarian joke. That's how, at the basic level, our social identity function. But today, the choice really is free. And it's, for this very reason, experienced as even more frustrating. We find ourselves constantly in the position of having to decide about matters that will fundamentally affect our lives, but without a proper foundation in knowledge. To quote my severe critic, who really hates me, John Gray, but here I agree with him, we have been thrown into a time in which everything is provisional. New technologies alter our lives daily. The traditions of the past cannot be retrieved. At the same time, we have little idea of what the future will bring. We are forced to live as if we were free." Uh, end of quote. Maybe this is why it is so difficult to act today. Adrian Johnson, one of our fellow travelers, Lacanian fellow travelers, characterized very nicely today's geopolitical situation as, quote, <coughs> a situation in which the world's societies and humanity as a whole are facing multiple acute crises. 
global pandemic, environmental disasters, massive inequality, ballooning poverty, potentially devastating wars, and so on. Yet, we seem unable to take the admittedly radical or revolutionary measures necessary to resolve this crisis. We know things are broken. We know what needs fixing it. We even sometimes have ideas about how to fix them. But nevertheless, we keep doing nothing either to mend the damage already done or to prevent further easily, uh, uh, easy, further, uh, easily foreseeable damage." End of quote. What does this mean? The situation today is not that that's the paradox I wanted to impair of you. It's not that of, you know, ideological mystification, like, oh, they're telling us, no, it's not really an ecological crisis. No, we are bombarded all the time by, you know, all those metaphors. It's five minutes to noon, we should act, and so on. But somehow nothing happens. We cannot act. So the usual idea that the truth is in our acts, not in our lives, has to be turned around. I, I must, another of my guilty pleasures, I sometimes watch, it's over now, you know, that TV series about that crazy doctor, House. In one episode, somebody says, even your actions lie. And that's the paradox today. Look at one of the most disgusting events, I think, recently, it was when? A year and a half, two years ago already, that Glasgow conference about global warming. In some sense, all the right things were said there. You know, we have to act now, blah, 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 blah. But uh, we say and we say it and, and things go on. And that's, again, today's uh, cynicism. Uh, why are we passive? Where does this passivity come from? Today's global capitalism generates apathy precisely because it demands from us permanent hyperactivity, constant engagement in its devastating dynamic. Uh, so uh, I want to give you here another example, very problematic politically for some of you where also we can see how crucial it is, not only with regard to our sexual mess, but with regard to the political situation, how, we, how important this Freudian split is. I don't know if you followed it closely, but when on the 23rd of February, Russia attacked Ukraine, uh, I was shocked by the reaction of my friends, which was a kind of a relief. OK, now it will be quickly over. Our, it's absolutely clear, if you read retroactively with the documents, that our secret hope, desire, was that, OK, it will be over in two, three days. Uh, Russian commanders will take over Kiev, it's over, then we will co complain a little bit, but life will go on and so on and so on. The real unexpected trauma is that Ukrainians <laughs> resisted, you know. That was the big, we really don't like it, and no matter how much we try to help them now and so on and so on. But let me go on. The, uh, the aftermath of the constant uh, Capitalist innovation is the permanent production of the piles of leftover waste. The obverse of the incessant capitalist drive to produce new and new objects are growing piles of useless waste, piles, piled mountains of used cars, computers, and so on. Like, it's a wonderful place to visit, you should. The famous old plains resting place in the Mojave Desert. In these ever-growing piles of inert, dysfunctional stuff, which cannot but strike us as strike us with their useless inert presence, one can, as it were, perceive the capitalist drive at rest. Objects. That's why, if you want to ask me what to do, not 
at the level of actual change, but at the level of at least acquiring the distance from this crazy capitalist dynamic. I remember, I don't know if the fashion is still going on, but some 20, 30 years ago, when I visited Japan, the fashion was in swing, full swing. The fashion of, maybe you met some of them, uh, or read, the so-called, I'm sorry if I mispronounce it, uh, Shindogu, some, which means there was a whole fashion of producing objects which uh, function, but function in such a crazy, useless way that you cannot commercialize them. It's meaningless. For example, there were glasses with, uh, how do you call this, to, against rain? Windshield wipers. Windshield wipers, so that you can, or there are inverted uh, uh, umbrellas, so that when it rains, water is, uh, collected in a bottle and you can always uh, drink fresh water. I find something so refreshing in this. Instead of being against technology, as it were, undermining it from within, you know, it's wonderful, it works, but it's, in some sense, it's meaningless. That's why I still like Andrei Tarkovsky's films, exemplary his masterpiece, Stalker which takes place in a post-industrial wasteland with wild vegetation growing over abandoned factories, concrete tunnels and railroads full of stale water and wild overgrowth in which stray cats and dogs wander. Uh, wander. Nature and industrial civilization are here again overlapping, but through a common decay. Civilization in decay is in the process of again being reclaimed by nature. That's why this is what I like about Tarkovsky's films. There is a lot of experience of a divine, sacred there, but it's not our usual Christian experience. It's not our filthy earth and then you look up. No, if you saw some Tarkovsky films, copy them, you get them on, on uh, even on YouTube for free, like Stalker. His experience of the sacred is, you are down on earth, you put your head in muddy water, you, as if the sacred is in the filth of this, in the filth of this uh, earth. Here I would like to, since some of you I know like Walter Benjamin, a wonderful uh, notion of uh, Benjamin's. He defined natural history as re-naturalized history. It takes place when historical artifacts lose their meaningful vitality and are perceived as dead objects reclaimed by, by nature. And I think that to be a real ecologist today. This is the first step. To get rid of any notion of pure, pristine, real nature, to accept this weird, like living dead, nature which is not some real natural nature, but which is our civilization in its ruins being uh, recaptured by nature. Here, I want to define this as uh, something that already in the early years of the Soviet Union, that utopian moment, but this was, I cannot resist making a, a, a political uh, a remark. You know, in this utopian moment, Ukraine, as we know it today, was born. Did you notice something if, sorry, I cannot escape it, if you, Check it out, the two Putin's crucial speeches, 21st and 23rd of February, when he announced attack on Ukraine. Did you notice that he critically mentions only one name? You know which name? Lenin. He said Ukraine was Lenin's invention. He even says that the proper name of Ukraine should be Ukraine of named by in Russian, Ukraine, Imeni Vladimir, named Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. And uh, that's why, in a nice, brutal irony, when they were taking down monuments to Lenin in Ukraine, he says, ah, you want decommunization. Wait, when we will be there, you will get real decommunization. 
The point being, uh, Lenin invented Ukraine. It's of course much more complex, but what I'm saying here is that, uh, 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 what I'm uh, saying here is uh, that at that utopian moment, which ended up in failure, of course. But it's very interesting. Ukraine in the 1920s was maybe closer than other parts of uh, the Soviet Union, a place for, it was destined to fail, but a place of some kind of socialist utopia. Like, I would like to be at that point, you, you know that in a small Ukrainian town, I forgot which one, at some art academy, they were teaching in the same building the two opposite modernists, Chagall and Malevich. They hated each other, but that was the situation. Everything was bursting. Ukrainian language, which was also prohibited in the Tsarist times, what became a proper language with, uh, with dictionaries, grammar books being written, and so on and so on. Then with Stalin, it all, uh, it all changed. So what I'm saying is that in that utopian time, we got uh, this wonderful expression, objects as comrades, to learn to treat natural objects as, as comrades. Now, let me be very careful here. This doesn't mean the bullshit of, uh, oh, I, I communicate this kind of fake neo-spiritualism. There is a spiritual dimension in nature I, I communicate with. No, this is the stuff of King Charles, ex-Prince Charles one of the great idiots who boasted in an interview 20 years ago, asked, what do you do in the evening? Where? I like to go to a garden and have a conversation with trees. No, thanks, you know. But uh, uh, it means accept our environment in all its complex mixture that includes what we perceive as trash or pollution, as well as what we cannot directly perceive since it is too large or too minuscule. Tim Morton's hyper objects. In, along this line for Tim Morton, I disagree with him philosophically, but here he has some very interesting uh, notions. Uh, being ecological for Morton, a quote, is not about spending time in a pristine nature preserve but about appreciating the wheat working its way through a crack in the concrete. It's also part of the world and part of us. Reality is populated with strange strangers. This strange strangeness is an irreducible part of every rock, tree, plastic statue of liberty, quasar, black holes, and so on and so on. So that's his idea. Nature is not pristine, nature is precisely this mixtures, or mixture of all forms of decay and so on and so on. Before I pass to the final uh, part, uh, I want just to give you two wonderful examples of how uh, such mixture can function. Do you remember you are close to Manhattan? I didn't experienced it, but I read in the newspaper the fate, the fate of rats in Manhattan during the pandemic. Manhattan is a living system of humans, cockroaches, and millions of rats. Lockdown at the peak of the pandemic meant that since all restaurants were closed, rats who lived off the trash from restaurants were deprived of the source of their food. This caused mass starvation. Many rats were found eating their offspring and so on and so on. And then uh, 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 the, the horror is some of my friends experienced this. When they opened the first restaurants only out, not inside, on the street, uh, 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 guests, customers reported that all the time uh, rats were running uh, between their legs because they were starved. They were desperately searching for food. This would be a nice view, you know? Why only pandemic for humans? What did it mean for rats? 
I can imagine an evil science fiction story in the style of Patricia Highsmith, read her, the greatest, of telling the pandemic experience from the standpoint of rats, you know, the horror and my leftist rat dream. The rats try to organize some war communism, you know, <laughs> end of individualism for rats. Another example, which is even more tragic. You know that in 1958, at the beginning of the Great Leap Forward, the Chinese government declared that, this is official formulation, birds are public animals of capitalism because they are destroying uh, uh, harvest on fields and so on and so on. So, so there was a big public campaign to eliminate uh, sparrows. Their nests were destroyed, eggs were broken, chicks were killed, millions of people organized in groups and hit noisy pots and pants to prevent sparrows from resting in their nests. So they, when they got tired, they dropped down and they were collecting. It sounds nice. And it was a totally successful campaign. There was just a problem. When the campaign was over, they all of a sudden discovered what, uh, uh, what a positive function rats also played. Uh, sorry, sparrows. They uh, ate in the fields large number of insects and so on, so that rice yields after the campaign were substantially decreased. It was hunger, one of the conditions of the big hunger in that point. So that this is wonderful absurdity. In 1960, Chinese government had to buy from Soviet Union one million sparrows to, to, to repopulate them. Uh, uh, so what's the problem with ecological awareness? I want to, I am, don't be afraid, I am approaching the conclusion. Uh, the, uh, I want to quote a passage from George Orwell in 19, he wrote it in 1937, where he deployed the ambiguity of the predominant leftist attitude towards class difference. He claims that all progressive guys want poverty to disappear, classes to disappear, but they don't mean it. It's very perceptible observation. It holds for many so-called postmodern theorists today, I claim. You do all the critical analysis and so on, but basically you do this just to make it sure the things will not really change, you know. It's like me, I'm saying this from my personal experience. If there ever was um, obsessional neurotic, it's me. And I'm doing this, that a lot of academia functions like this today. You talk, we are in deep crisis, panic, and so on, but you talk just to make it sure that nothing will really change. How did I experience this? When I was, just for a couple of months, I couldn't stand it, in psychoanalysis, I talked all the time, the 10 minutes short Lacanian session that I was allotted. All the time. Why? Then I look deep into my heart. Because I was afraid that if I stop talking for a second, the analyst may ask me a really tough question. <laughs> so you see the paradox. I was talking all the time to making it sure that nothing will change. And I think that this is how we are dealing today basically with ecology. So I will read a quote from, uh, from Orwell. I will just replace poverty or class with global warming. Look now the quote. We all rail against global warming, but very few people seriously want to abolish it. So long as it is merely a question of ameliorating the lot of ordinary people, every decent person is agreed. But unfortunately, you get no further by merely wishing global warming away. More necess exactly, it is necessary to wish it away, but your wish has no efficacy unless you grasp what it involves. The fact that has got to be faced is that uh, 
To abolish global warming means abolishing a part of yourself. Each of us will have to alter him, herself, so completely that at the end, he, she, it will hardly be recognizable uh, as the same person. And I take this very seriously, this statement. Namely, I had a certain, although I was a fascist totalitarian privately, I lack state order, total control. Uh, I, was, uh, I was for uh, uh, obligatory, uh, how do you call it? Uh, vaccination. But uh, I had a certain sympathy for those who opposed it, some American populist right-wingers, Agamben, because I think they got it. <laughs> no, Agamben is not this, although strangely, he all of, you know, it's so incredible how often today the apparent opponents speak the same language. I'm now finishing a new text of how we all make fun of Russia, but how Russian official Orthodox Putin, Dugin, and those guys' ideology echoes the most fanatical American new Christian populism. Like, are you following what is going now in Russia? Now, officially, it's not one nut guy saying it. Officially, the goal is no longer uh, uh, denazification of Ukraine, but desatanization. Uh, 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 Patriarch Kirill, the, the boss of Orthodox Church, give, gave an official claim a week ago, uh, title to Putin, chief exorcist. And people are now talking of desatanization and so on, that Ukraine is not, no longer a normal state, but a kind of satanic cult regime, and that Western Europe is also becoming it, and so on, and so on. Uh, so uh, 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 I sympathize with those people who said, but this type of control, you cannot meet your fellows, and so on. It definitely really affects Im imposes us to renounce some features, how you socialize and so on, which we did spontaneously perceive as part of being human. This was, this was real. So I think that's the difficult task ahead. Uh, we need more globalization, not less. We need global solidarity and cooperation more than ever. You remember, friends were sending me thoughts. It was horrible. You remember uh, last summer, a year and a half ago in June, you remember there was a so-called heat dome in uh, northern, northwest of the United States, southwest of Canada, Seattle, Vancouver. Temperatures almost 50 degree Celsius, which means at that point, that part of United States, Canada was warmer, warmer, warmer than Saudi Arabia, the Middle East, and so on. But here I disagree with those who don't trust state authority and claim, no, uh, ecology movement, it shouldn't be left to the state, it should be done from below, uh, people fight locally and then only if necessary. No, sorry. Uh, if you look at, uh, measure them by ecological criteria, those parts, northwest of the United States, southwest uh, of Canada, were not doing bad. They were in, at the level of ecological measures, pretty well. The problem is that uh, this dome, heat dome, was the result of a global perturbation of how the air circulate in northern spheres of, of, uh, of, of uh, 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 Arctic spheres of our planet. So this means that heat dome was a local phenomenon, but it is the result of global disturbances. So we cannot, it's meaningless to do it on the local level. The approach has to be global. Next point, and this is the really scary point. Science and technology today no longer aim only at understanding and reproducing natural processes. At the same time, we try to generate new forms of life that will surprise us. The goal is no longer just to dominate nature the way it is, 
but to generate something new, greater, stronger than ordinary nature, including ourselves. The dream that sustains the scientific technological endeavor is to trigger a process with no return, a process that would exponentially reproduce itself and go on on its own. The notion of second nature, which is not thus society reified in new nature, but literally new monstrous form of life, something like ha what happened in the past from time to time due to pathological contingency, deformed cows with two head, heads, uh, deformed trees, and so on, and so on. I think that uh, it is this horror that religion tries to uh, domesticate today. That's why I agree with some Lacanians who claim that far from religion being uh, threatened by new technological developments, religion is approaching its golden era. Why? Because it is this horror of new, as it were, artificial nature running out of control that religion tries to uh, domesticate. Uh, uh, this fear is, it also has its clear libidinal dimension. It is the fear of the asexual reproduction of life, the fear of an undead life that is indestructible, constantly expanding, reproducing itself through asexual self-division multiplication. And the greatest master to exploit this fear is the Catholic Church. Its predominant strategy today is that of trying to contain the scientific real within the confines of meaning. A quote, I'm now in very, on very bad terms with him, but here he wrote something which I still conditionally agree with. I quote Jacqueline Miller, quote, Far from being effaced by science, religion is progressing every day. Lacan said that ecumenism was for the poor of spirit. There is a marvelous agreement on these questions between the secular and all the religious authorities in which they tell themselves that they should agree somewhere in order to make echoes equally marvelous uh, we see this because it is revealed that, uh, uh, sorry, I, I, I skipped some part, religion is planted in the position of unconditional defense of the living, of life in mankind as guardian of life, making life absolute. And that extends to the protection of human nature. This is what gives a future to religion through meaning, namely by erecting barriers to cloning, to the exploitation of human cells, and to inscribe science into a temperate progress. We see a marvelous effort, a new youthful vigor of religion in its effort to flood the real with meaning." End of quote. So allow me just to finish. The church's message of hope thus relies on a pre-existing fear. It evokes and formulates the fear against which it then offers a solution of hope and faith. The life that it promises in its defense of the culture of life is a reactive life, a defense against death. And no wonder that the predominant version of ecology is the ecology of fear, fear that pushes us to plan measures that would protect our uh, safety. How then, what to do here? Because this is, admit it, even if you are not religious, this is our common reaction. Horrible things potentially are the result of science, our intervention, and nobody wants to renounce science, but how? to retain it within the confines of meaning. Meaning in the sense of global, organic, totality of humanity, its progress, and so on, and so on. To really conclude, believe me, I 
I will now finish with something that's already mentioned in some of my books. I think that the only rational, if we are still capable of rational thinking, solution is the opposite one. And it's not a utopia, it is already happening. To resuscitate what Alain Badiou, with whom I disagree, but here I still agree with him, called the eternal idea of revolutionary justice. What is demanded, the four components of uh, Badiou's notion of uh, justice are, first, strict egalitarianism, egalitarian justice. All of us who deal with ecology agree with this. All people should pay, ideally, the same price in eventual renunciations. One should impose the same worldwide norms per capita of energy consumption and so on and so on. So, justice. Then, uh, uh, terror. Absolutely, I'm for. Terror, of course, in the sense of ruthless punishment of all those who violate the imposed protective measures and so on and so on. You will say, I am dreaming here. No, I'm not. The first step towards terror, as I gladly observed, you know, you cannot have terror without whistleblowers. And I find an extreme ethical progress in the fact that in the last 10, 20 years, whistleblowers were elevated into new heroes. Are we aware that we are talking here about something that historically was associated with terror? Third thing, uh, voluntarism. We should drop this standard Marxist reliance on history is on our side. No, as again Walter Benjamin put it, history is not on our side. If we let history go on the way it is, we are just approaching some form of, of uh, collective suicide. Again, as Benjamin said, uh, today the task of a revolution is not to help the historical tendency, but to stop the train of history, which runs towards a uh, 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 precipice. So again, it's voluntarism in the good sense that we cannot rely, even, I think we should even renounce any subject. Now that nobody trusts the so-called old-fashioned working class, we are all, and this goes on from the 60s, in search of an ersatz, additional subject of emancipation. You know, it can be a uh, it can be, I don't know, third world traditional culture, like as the fashionable people said, a possible site of resistance towards global capitalism. I totally disagree. I, th I think that global capitalism always liked aboriginal local cultures to survive. I mean, just look at India, where the moment in, uh, British imperialists took over India, their first idea was to strengthen Hindu religion. They reprinted all the, what they feared were Indians who would try to imitate them too much, becoming uh, adept to technology. No, no, no. Every British imperialist was always ready to say, my God, we are so vulgar in the West, and in, uh, uh, modest Indian farmer has more wisdom that, than all uh, our vulgar Western civilization, and so on, and so on. So uh, uh, it's voluntarism, and last but not least, what is traditionally called trust, uh, trust in the people. Like, uh, yes, terror, but genuine popular terror. <laughs> Ordinary people denounce those in power. Now, you will say, I'm dreaming. No, I'm not. You know who wrote a wonderful text? I don't fully agree with him, but uh, uh, Joseph Stiglitz, the economist. He wrote, I don't know where, I read it in some project syndicate marginal site for comments. He had an, a simple insight. He says that now that we are caught in a war, Europe is approaching a war for Ukraine and also other global conflicts, we still act as if we can at the same time 
play the war, support Ukraine, but somehow keep safe our peaceful way of life. It can be done. He said, you cannot win a war, even the war against ecology, with all normal civil market economy going on. We will have, don't be afraid, I'm not a militarist, although I'm also not a peace, a peacenik for peace. You know why not? The first problematic thing is that, just think about it. I think that whenever you have a situation of occupation, uh, uh, occupiers are always sincerely for peace. Of course, today in Palestine, Israel is totally for peace on the West Bank because peace <laughs> means we have it. So it's for me very problematic this uh, situation of peace. Now you will say, but now we are maybe approaching a situation of a deadlock of front in Ukraine. Maybe it's time to put pressure on Ukraine to accept peace. Maybe. But my counterpoint is, but are you aware that we are in this situation because we supported militarily Ukraine? Without Western support of Ukraine, Ukraine would have been long uh, occupied and so on and so on. So uh, the, the stance, I cannot now advocate concrete measures, it's A, voluntarism without any guarantee in the big other. We don't have any higher necessity, natural order or whatever to rely on. We will be obliged to make, to, to make tremendous risks. And the only way to avoid the trap, to avoid the catastrophe is to, uh, is to withdraw from this, totally, anihil, totally renounce this pseudo-ecological, I claim, because it mystifies nature, idea of a deeper meaning in nature, of a deeper meaning of phenomena. Yes, there will be catastrophes, but the worst thing possible is to read these catastrophes as signs of a deeper meaning. And it's very difficult to resist this push towards meaning. The story that I often repeat, maybe you know it, even in Israel, I made some of them, a sect not even so small, hundreds of thousands, which claims that uh, the Jews, because they were too decadent in Western Europe before Hitler, they deserved Holocaust. They were guilty, that that's the meaning of Holocaust. I find this terrifying, this projection of meaning, which makes things uh, easier. So I advocate, again, what? Uh, much stronger global cooperation, isn't it absolute? Just uh, think even independently of for what is ahead. Because of changing weather patterns and global warming, there will be much more immigrants, poverty, and so on. Things like this did already happen in the past, but they were usually resolved in a violent way. One nation moved, occupied another, and the, the stronger guy won, and so on, and so on. We cannot, because of nuclear weapons and other things, we cannot afford a thing like this. So I think, and this is why I provocatively like to define myself as still a communist, not in the sense of the Central Committee decides, no, if anything, the 19th century 20th century communism was ecologically worse than liberal democracy. But I claim that if there will not be some kind of, not abolishment of the market, but let's say socializ socialization of uh, economy in the sense of we will have to make decisions what to produce, how to coordinate, which, ca which cannot be left to the market. If we don't take this path, then we are lost. Thanks very much. I'm sorry if I was too long. There is, in fact, uh, time for a Q&A. Um, we have a microphone here. Um, 
Alonso will bring it to you. Um, we have like another 30 minutes before we have to leave the room, so um, maybe keep it compact. Um, I try to keep a list. Uh, the, I think the person in the blue sweater first. Ah. Okay. Okay. Uh, cheers, good to see you again since Berkeley. Uh, about the end of nature, have civilization and technology disrupted the biological process of natural selection? With Hegel, therefore, are there rational principles organizing history? Could the Freudian pleasure principle be one of them, if not the most dominant of them all? Oh, that's a nice, I like this question, like no bullshitting. I was afraid that this, your question, will be followed by 10 minutes of your own thoughts on it. <laughs> Thanks very much. I would say, I read a book on this, and it convinced me. It's that, you know that, through its intelligence, even modest technologies, and so on, in some sense, humanity itself disturbs the process of natural selection. In the sense that we violate, if we may call it truly natural uh, selection and so on. On the other hand, let's not mystify again natural selection as something authentic, the, the truly more capable, strong guy survives. All good from Stephen Jay Gould on, or good evolutionary biologists make it clear that it's not a question of uh, the best guy wins. It's totally contingent. The best guy is on the top, then some small thing like some natural disaster changes the environment and the previous uh, guy is on the top and so on. So again, first, don't mystify. I'm not saying you did it, but my idea, don't mystify natural selection into some kind of an authentic process where true quality uh, emerges. And uh, second thing, uh, beware that with humans, it's uh, also a process of struggle for survival, blah, blah, but it functions the moment you have historical memory and so on, it functions in a different way. Cultural selection is not just, as some vulgar evolutionary guys think, the, the, the prolongation of natural selection. It's something uh, totally different. And I like, in some of my books I wrote about it, this idea of how a certain, let's call it, sexual aesthetic concern was from the beginning even in those so-called most primitive societies, uh, an element of survival. For example, there are now, I like to read them, although I cannot judge how appropriate their theories are, the idea is that, you know, we all admire, but at the same time think how stupid they are, those, if you find the primitive uh, Stone Age hammers with just uh, 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 wood and on it a big stone fixed and so on. And the idea is that all this, the function was not efficiency. It was just this external spectacle show of, uh, how do you call the stupid animals uh, uh, who have these big mega feathers? Pe peacock? Sorry? A peacock, peacock yes. yes. You know what's the big, sorry, my problem, you know what's the big problem with peacocks? You have these gigantic feathers. In what sense does this help you in your survival? It makes you much more clumsy and so on and so on. So the theory is that the message is precisely this one, a similar one, like why should all, if you are in love, or presents to your beloved in principle be useless. You don't give to your, sorry for my sexist uh, perspective, if you like a girl, you don't give, give her socks or underwear. You give her a, a, a ring, gold, and so on, which is precisely totally useless. And the idea is that it's something similar in the case of a peacock. It's, you see, I'm so strong that I can carry on my back all this mega shit and I still survive. <laughs> so I like this idea that there is a certain, as it were,
very primitive aesthetic logic at work there. Also, I like the theory of some serious evolutionary theorists that language, even Daniel Dennett says at some point this, that language was not invented to tell the truth. Like, our language is not the prolongation of that stupid beast language, you know. You make this movement, it means there are a lot of flowers down there. No, language is originally an instrument to lie. That from the very beginning. So again, I, I think it's a very complex question what you said. We have to clarify the terms more. So. Okay. Here in the front. Thank, thank you so much for this talk. It was fascinating. Uh, when you begin like this, I see you sharpening your knife behind your back. <laughs> <laughs> Go to that point directly. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I thought, are you a communist or a filthy liberal? <laughs> you should say yes and wave a knife at me. <laughs> oh my God. A death. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> I have a Latin American background, so maybe this question goes, comes from there. Uh, there is this debate between conservatives and liberals, just to play, put it simple, uh, on gender. And, yeah. and uh, yeah. taking you back to the introduction, if you may. Uh, where conservatives accuse liberals to uh, spread uh, an ideology of gender. And the liberal thinkers reject that as a false accusation, saying that ideology of gender doesn't exist. Um, but I heard that in your introduction you actually used some kind of those uh, phrases. So in what sense uh, a gender ideology is an ideology and uh, why, do you, why did you call it like that? And how do you explain this rhetoric used between liberal and conservative? Rejected? First, let me make my position clear and say something. Uh, ideology, in our intellectual struggles, I I think that this general culture war between postmodern liberals and traditionalists is a false war. In the, okay, but I don't want to get lost. Okay, to your precise question. Ideology. Uh, first, I, as I developed repeatedly in my books, I think that uh, trans people experience, I'm still for sexual difference, but I don't conceive it as this fixed binary difference between masculine, feminine, but as a certain deadlock, trouble, I take the expression gender trouble maybe more seriously than Judith Butler, uh, inscribed into the very basic constitutive structure of human sexuality, and often I think what, you know, as an old uh, Hegelian, when you have this opposition, traditional conservatives attacking ideology of uh, gender and gender attacking the opposite side as, again, binary uh, patriarchal ideology and so on, I think that they both share something. In so far as, uh, how do you call it, the opposite side? the trans, LGBT, whatever, it, only, I oppose them only insofar as they share a feature, which is what? For conservatives, you have something like, it even doesn't have to be fully natural, but a certain traditional form, patriarchal family, sexual difference, uh, uh, and so on, which is the standard, and then they read what goes on today as the result of this, uh, uh, as the result of the gradual disintegration of these standards, with the obvious idea, let's return to, to the past. Of course, this is ideology if there ever was one. And I use here the term ideology, let's not go into what it really means in a very commonsensical way. A, it's factually wrong, and B, it serves certain interests of those in power, men, blah, blah, whatever you want. Uh, but where do I 
disagree with some version of LGBT plus feminists. I already basically said it. For me, they enter ideology the moment they presume that in itself, sexuality is some polymorphously preserved, uh, perverse fluid state, you freely choose your identity and so on. And then from outside due to social domination, this, as it were, free flow is is uh, controlled, disciplined by binary patriarchal logic. I think that the shit, the trouble, is already in human sexuality as such. And I will give you an example, I use it, I'm so sorry, in my last book, which uh, is my favorite. Uh, come, uh, 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 Columnist in The Guardian magazine, Eve Weissman, uh, 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 wrote uh, some two years ago an article where she is horrified at something which she considers totally terrifying, our today's decadence and so on. It is, I'm sorry if some of you know the story, she was watching, and I like watching them, Don't, I, I, I'm not a, a crazy guy who watches hardcore uh, uh, movies. I think they, they usually depress me so much that I think if you are an infomaniac or sexual perverse, the way to cure you is to make you watch these movies for hours every day if you don't get totally impotent and free with. But she noticed something. They are very interesting. Movies about making a hardcore movie where you see the whole scene, you know the couple or whoever doing it, and then behind the camera, okay. And in movie, I only rely on this lady's, on this woman's report, I didn't see it, but the way she describes it, it's traditional. On a bed, a guy is, sorry, I want to cut it short, screwing a lady, and in the middle of it, he stops, steps back, and says, my God, I'm sorry, I'm losing erection. Please give me my iPhone so that I go quickly to, uh, I go quickly to Pornhub. <laughs> but you know the crazy paradox of this. What do you want? You have the real woman there. And as if that's not enough, you, you need Pornhub, you need the image to do it. But that's, I think, the structure of sexuality. You always need a fiction, a fantasy, you know. This is the fundamental gap in sexuality. That's why Freud's point is not whatever we are saying, we are cyclically thinking about sex. No, it's what we are thinking when we do make love, when we have sex. And yet, it can be very strange things. For example, you know Ludwig Wittgenstein, the great philosopher? He was a little bit crazy, so when he was serving the Austrian army, he was regularly in the First World War, he was regularly masturbating, and he wrote in his diaries, they were discovered recently and published by a friend of mine in Vienna, what his dreams were while he was masturbating. It was not screwing a man or a woman, whatever. It was debating with philosophers abstract question. <laughs> you know? And there is a truth in it. You don't have zero level. Healthy, normal sexuality is just my body, another's body. No, the structure is origin. It's originally this gap. You have some nonsensical, stupid, real. And it's all, you are always courting the danger that you appear, that you experience this brutal reality in all its stupidity. Look in a non-sexual way, a sexual act. Can you imagine anything more stupid? <laughs> it's pure stupidity. So you need fantasy support. And that's why now I will do something very nasty, referring a little bit to myself, but maybe some of you. I'm here too reflexive. Often it happened to me, sorry to be so open, but it's not too embarrassing. In the middle of sexual act, when I was still young and <laughs> doing it, I, I, I 
as it were, fall out of it, you know, like I observed myself from, uh, what am I doing here, my God, you know, isn't this just a bird? Uh, 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 and uh, there fantasy has to enter. And you know, you need a fantasy, but then fantasy can disintegrate and so on. Fantasy can uh, disintegrate and so on and so on, you know. And again, uh, I think that what I like potentially, all this LGBT stuff and so on, is extremely profound by making clear how, what a terrible deadlock sexuality is. But it becomes ideology when it falls into the trap of claiming that there is some zero level, even they, if they would not admit it, zero level healthy sex, only secondarily disturbed by, by, uh, by, by social oppression and so on and so on. I mean, sex is such a mess, in what sense? You know, there is oppression of certain way of enjoyment, but in sexuality it always gets turned around so that you all of a sudden start to enjoy oppression itself. That's the basic mechanism of obsessional neurotics. You are ashamed of some of your secret desires and you ad uh, adopt or construct rituals to fight them. But then you start to enjoy these very rituals and so on. As now I will mention her in a positive way, as Judith Butler develops in one of her a, a, a book of essays, which is much better than her other stuff, I think on something desire and so on, I forgot. No, no, a later one. Uh, 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 where uh, she develops how the basic mechanism of psychoanalysis is that a repression of desire necessarily turns into a desire for repression. You start to enjoy uh, repression itself. And as she admits it here, she is a good Hegelian, there is no way to step back out of this mess and say, oh, now I've reached pure innocent uh, pleasure and so on. So I think this is the only thing I have problems with, with some version of this LGBT stuff and so on. As if, if we get rid of, uh, uh, of patriarchal binary structure, we will enjoy a full, uh, full, plural, whatever, unconstrained sex. No, we will not. The mess is constitutive. Sorry, I prefer not to go too far. I, can we get, it's not hypocritical, but my, these were good <laughs> questions, but, uh, Quite often, and I'm not patronizing women, my God, I'm afraid of women. How could, should I not be afraid of women when in the last 20, 30 years, all good books on Hegel were written by women. It started with Gillian Rose, uh, even the early Judith, Subject of Desire, then you have Rebecca Comey now, you have, so I am afraid of women, they're getting too bright. <laughs> so uh, what I'm saying is that, I'm saying out of this sincere concern, can't we get some questions, even they are aggressive from women, so that men will not. Yes, the bad. woman to the front, please. To the front. <laughs> please. Yeah. Don't be shy. Uh, uh, I'm going to <laughs> <laughs> um, and even uh, another thing, refer reference to you, I'm not changing the topic, when you said, I'm so sad I wasn't able to go into it, you know why, because I just finished the book, all of this, what I have to say about universality and so on, is already in my books, but my favorite example, that's what, why I don't like nation of Islam style black identity politics. For me, the true hero is his universal thinker, Malcolm X. He is a Hegelian genius, as I developed a couple of times. Why? You know what's his big trick? 
he assumes X. X stands for we will turn out of our African natural roots. We don't have identity. But his conclusion is not that roots bullshit you. No, no. We should now return, search our roots. No, it's that this gives us blacks a chance to become more free universal than white people. He asks a much more radical universality. He is, for me, again, one of the true authentic, that's why he was killed. Because the, he was killed, probably, it's not clear, by the Nation of Islam guys, you know, who were precisely black identity politicians. And they, no wonder some of them, black identity politicians have, like Louis Farrakhan is politically more on the right side and so on, you know. They fit perfectly with, with uh, white fundamentalists and so on. All the, the white fundamentalist line is identity politics, wonderful thing. We just want also our own identity <laughs> to be, you know. So the way to fight racism is precisely not to accept a particular identity as justifying anything. That's why I agree here with Gilles Deleuze, who said that any politics which has to refer to a specific experience, you know, like only a, a black single mother with AIDS can really know what means whatever, this is a catastrophe. All true emancipatory politics has to have this universal dimension in it. It doesn't mean you renounce your particularity, but you somehow read your particularity, that's crucial, as a sign of what is wrong in our universality itself. That's why I wrote a short text recently, very short, supporting what goes on in Iran now. It's an incredible event. Women uh, protesting for their, uh, their rights, blah, blah, you know the story, but they became the focus of it in the sense that it's a wonderful event. Men somehow got the basic lesson that the only way to their freedom is to support women. Women are now the concrete universality there. You cannot be for freedom in Iran without supporting what women are, uh, are doing now. Sorry, I got lost. The next one. Where is the woman? Or the seas or trench or whatever you want. Yes, do I see your hand there. Oh, Claudia Brodsky has a question. Yes, sir. Professor Brodsky. I don't know who so easy now, I can just introduce Hegel via Zizek's hmm. version of Hegel, which is a Lacanian version of Hegel. So let me just ask you this. Uh, your version of Hegel, which is Hegel's version of Hegel, the opposites are not only not opposite, but they in some way need each other, etc., etc. That's everything that you've said, uh, and, and it makes perfect sense, and, I, and like Hegel, you would like a global state, and I completely understand that. Like, okay. no, no, I know what you mean, I know yeah, what yeah. you mean. Know what you mean? Yeah. <laughs> and like Hegel, yes, it would be great to have the mandatory vaccination. It's a, I mean, I, 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 I'm not disputing that myself. This is not, yeah. this is not minor, minor yeah. right now. That's 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 where Hegel is tending, and everyone says, oh, this is terrible. This is universal spirit. We have to kill it before it spreads. Okay, this is my question for you, because you've never really, because as a Lacanian, you're never going to address this question, which I respect. Huh? Which question? The question is. You know, and what, what to do with mediation. That is, Hegel has something that you never, in some very important way to you, which I understand, yeah. and again, I respect, you never really introduce the, the estranging fact of mediation. You're a perfect example of the indigenous cultures which are immediately 
made to as, oh, th look at these wonderful indigenous peoples doing their thing. The worst thing is when they become like us. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, but however, we also have to make them into us because we need these people to serve us in a yeah. certain way that we can understand. So this is all true, right? And, and the fact that capital is constantly using this and exploiting this mm. is all true. All of this is true. I couldn't agree more, right? My but question is, Hegel has this other thing, which is not a Lacanian principle yeah. at all, called mediation, which doesn't mean, which for him is negation, right? Determinate negation. So it doesn't mean, <laughs> it, does, it doesn't mean a happy medium. You understand? It doesn't mean what we're all doing here, and it certainly doesn't mean, well, I can choose to be whatever I want to do because I'm living in the happy medium or something like this. Yeah, yeah. Without constraints, without determinate yeah. negation, or without what, like a while ago, you called trauma. So I'm just gonna ask you this because yeah. I know I've heard you speak before, I've never felt like it was so clearly Hegelian without the thought of mediation. You see, as if the mediation would somehow contradict the problem of the opposites which simply eat each other, right? Simply reflect each other and need to consume each other. Uh, it was also nice to hear St Stephen Jay Gould mention that the fact that it's pure chance, or as, or as Hegel would yeah, say, yeah. the animals, they look at something, mm -hmm. they don't really reflect about its mystical being and its ontology, they eat it. You know, it's like, that's not their problem. You know, that's not nature's problem, right? Uh, we import this being, this mystical divine being to objects, a sensuous objects, animals, they eat them. I mean, it, it's, it's exactly what you're saying, but that's the, uh, but the animal's not mediating. <laughs> and I'm not saying mediation is good. I have no, it's kind of minor, right? I'm not offering an opinion. Yeah. I'm just wondering, since I'll never have the opportunity probably again, to ask you directly, und was von der Mitteil? You know, what, what about mediation? That's all. I'm not saying, again, good, bad, oh, you've missed yeah, yeah. it, liberal democracy, blah, blah, blah. I'm not doing any of that. I'm asking you if you've ever had like a, a th like a strong reflection on mediation. That's it. I think, okay, I didn't write a treatise on mediation, but I think that in some sense, all the time I'm talking about it, I'll give you a concrete example. What I uh, improvised in a confused, tired way to your question, it's all about mediation. It's sex, even the most immediate one. Well, me and my partner, it's, med it's mediated through fantasy. Absolutely. It, absolutely, it's mediated through fantasy and that's also yeah. a Lacanian principle, but it's not in the way that Hegel, I think, is talking about. That's all I can say. I know exactly what you mean. Oh, oh here I also, would, okay. That's also liberal democracy. Okay, but, yes. Yeah. sells really well, but, but that's not, I think, personally, I think that's one minor we I would, will okay. have. I don't think that's what he's I talking about. I would love to go into this debate because you know what I think Hegel's secret? It's not just that everything is mediated and so on and so on, it's no. that every mediation has to finish in a new form of immediacy. For example, the state as the universal medium of social mediation has to have at its top the monarch, the king or queen, Hegel doesn't go into this, who is something totally stupid, determined by nature, he doesn't have to have every, any qualities, but as such he is just a pure symbolic top. So uh, here, uh, here I, I uh, disagree, maybe I can give one hint in the sense of what, why I oppose what I call today predominant liberal Hegelians. And you can identify them immediately by one word, uh, uh, anerkennung, uh, 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 mutual recognition. As if this is, no, Hegel is here much more tricky. I love him. No, no, but you know what I'm uh, telling here? Uh, they have this liberal ideal of, you know, in a good society, we all recognize each other. But you know, which is for me the crucial, crucial Hegel's example of recognition. When he deals with death penalty, Hegel says, death penalty is the criminal's right. By condemning him to death, you recognize him as a responsible, rational, being. And all liberal Hegelians 
I spoke with, uh, uh, who is that guy who translated? No, apart from Pippin, of course, the, Brandon. not Brandon also, but the other guy. Oh, Pinkert. Pinkert, yes. They all have a problem if I tell them, but do you accept this also? Death penalty means true recognition of the, no, they want to have this ideal liberal notion of, uh, of, uh, reco of uh, recognition. Uh, you know, with Hegel, uh, frankly, I would have to know more because I think that I talk about mediation all the time Mediation in the sense, I will now do something horrible. I know you know this joke. There is a boring joke that I literally repeated, I think, over 10 times in my last books and in dozens of talks. This is for me mediation at its purest. You know, I'm so sorry to say it, but you know that joke from Ernst Lubitsch's Ninotska, no? I go to a restaurant and say, can I get coffee, but without cream, please. And the waiter says, sorry, we don't have cream, we only have milk, so I can only give you coffee without milk. That's mediation, because immediately, coffee without cream, coffee without milk, and plain coffee are materially the same. But uh, if you include mediation, they are not the same, although materially, Plain coffee is the same as coffee without milk, but the logic of mediation means that, bestimmte negation means that negation overdetermines over determines the identity, which is why I think, for example, feminism, authentic feminism arises when being a woman in an existing society is experience as a specific negation, not just negation of being a traditional woman, but negation of other, you know, feminism begins by somebody tells you, you are a woman, do your job, wash the dishes, whatever, and you say, no, in being a, in being a woman in this society, I am a woman without cream, which means without, uh, deprived of creativity, and so on and so on. So, uh, uh, but what I like in Hegel is that we cannot simply oppose mediation and immediacy at its most radical for Hegel, uh, uh, every immediacy is in some sense a retroactive effect of mediation. In the sense that you don't go, you don't go further in the sense of immediacy is getting mediated and so on and so on. You, Hegel's movement is I think more retroactive. You establish that what appeared as immediacy was always already uh, mediated and so on and so on. So with, uh, uh, with, uh, that's why I think that Hegel cannot be dismissed the way some philosophers of difference and so on try to get rid of him that, yeah, you have negation, mediation, but at the end, the spirit of, uh, or a big single object uh, 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 encapsulates all mediations. No, Hegel's view is, I think, much more, why not use the term desperate pessimist? For Hegel, reconciliation doesn't mean we are all friends, it means you reconcile with, accept, you accept the very madness of the world. You don't try to end compassion. That's why, and this is what I like about Hegel, if people don't believe that Hegel is really a figure of mediation, incompletion, openness, look at his history of philosophy, where in the introduction he says the crucial thing. He says all that philosophy can do is to describe the existing spiritual order, socio-political system, when it is already in its decay. Hegel says philosophy always comes too late. That's why philosophy absolutely cannot say anything about the future. 
because, and this holds even against Marx, I think, Hegel is fully aware that every image that we have of the future, no matter how utopian, is already mediated by our historical position. And Hegel is, as Pippin noted, Hegel was not, let's hope, an idiot, which means that these lines from introduction to philosophy of right obviously hold also for his system in philosophy of right. Hegel is not describing there the ideal soft fascist corporate system. He is describing a form which already was in decay in his time, which is why very important. Hegel's last text, a critique of this English reform bill, which introduced more first step towards uh, uh, general vote, Hegel is horrified by it because he sees something that he cannot grasp, something totally new is emerging. So my paradox is that Hegel, far from being that idiot who had absolute knowledge in the sense I know everything, Hegel is maybe the philosopher most open to future, much more than Marx. I think I advocate a Hegelian materialist critique of Marx. Ma <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I will get lost, but I appreciate your point, but this would be a wonderful session. Forget about these concrete problems and so on. But, you know, to have a talk not about nature, ecology, these actual problems, but, but about, let me give a pre-Socratic twist to your question, the one mediation and the absolute like. And then we have a big orgasmic colloquium with intellectual orgasms just remaining at this level. Thanks very much. Where are we now temporarily? I think we're pretty much at the end. Um, unless you, you, you still have like, a like the dog's kiss, it's the end, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, if you still have energy and you, okay, you, you want one more. one more, okay. Ah, oh, there's another okay, one. Fine. So that we at least uh, we at least realize this yin yang balance. You know? okay. how, how about we like we uh, collect the two questions together? Is that fine? Okay. 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 Uh, the first. If if there is a relationship between modern sexual identity politics and, and the destruction of the environment, which rests in a liberal secular idea of the autonomous self, which is a legacy of the European Enlightenment, which is why, for example, the countries where the sexual revolution has happened are also the countries at the forefront of the environmental destruction. Then does the pouring into Europe and Western countries of refugees who come from a culture which you in many places have described as being incompatible with modern Western values, yes. especially when it comes to questions of yeah. gender and sexuality, does that offer a hope for the future? Insofar as those cultures who are bringing these now other will, sexual mores yeah. may also be bringing ideas that are more better for the environment. I will give you a terrifying answer. Uh, wait, can we just... You will agree with. I will answer okay, to the lady. I'm uh, an okay. idiot. I like to one sorry. after one. <laughs> I, I think, and for this I was proclaimed Eurocentrist, racist, and so on, I think that the very conceptual apparatus which we use to criticize European Eurocentrism, imperialism, is still profoundly embedded in a European tradition of enlightenment. And I think that what we, I think that, you know, that's why I know some people from there disagree with me, but I still think that the highest moment of enlightenment and French revolution is the Haiti revolution. Without Haiti, black revolution, the French revolution would have been a, a local effect. And I'm not a racist here. I'm not saying, oh, we Europeans had a great idea and then uh, even the black slaves <laughs> copied it. No. They, only they made, again, we are back at concrete universality, only through Haiti revolution, the French revolution, equality, fraternity, became truly universal. They were in acts much, and Hegel acknowledged this, it's very nice. 
They were the true universalists. And all the honor goes here to Jacobins, who saw this. They immediately fully recognized a new Haiti, in contrast to Napoleon, who was a bad guy here. No? Napoleon sent the army there, which a glorious moment, which was defeated by, by the slaves. So what I'm saying is that I don't think that uh, uh, here I had a disagreement with my otherwise good friend Alain Badiou, who first are you Spanish from Latin America? From? Oh, wonderful. I, I'm always, now I will hurt somebody else. I always prefer Pakistan to India. <laughs> I think that Indians, uh, at least the Hindu Indians, have a much more violent sense of identity and so on. And? Yeah, uh, you know, first, I'm not, I'm not enough of an, I don't know enough to claim what is the political unconscious of the Pakistani youth and so on and so on. What I'm just saying is, and this will be much more problematic, it is that I don't, uh, I don't think that, that, the way to defeat European imperialism, racism, and so on, is that immigrants will bring some different, op and so on, and so on, and so on. You end up there in something like, for, because you know that this motive is now constantly repeated by Putin and Russian propaganda. Our defense, not attack in Ukraine, is part of the global struggle against Western domination, but then you see which are the countries that support them. Afghanistan, uh, Iran, and so on and so on. Especially, I find problematic the case of Afghanistan, where, as you m probably know, when Taliban took over, they immediately made a deal with China, which was a very brutal, pragmatic deal, which was China will leave them alone to do their Islamist stuff, but Taliban promised you do all the anti-Muslim stuff with Uyghurs there, and we don't care about that. And I am definitely against this type of multiculturalism, which means I leave you your oppression, you leave me alone in, in my oppression. I, uh, so uh, again, <coughs> uh, I, whenever I think that the ultimate form of racism, I always distrust it, is a European, not you, a European discovering some depth which can help us in another more, what would be the politically correct term from, for, pre, okay, pre-modern, society. There is always a fantasy there. That's why I am good friends with some native, you call them Native Americans, they hate the term. Because they claim, ah, we are Native Americans, so we are Native, what are you, cultural Americans? <laughs> you are cultural? Well, they told me if they hate something, is this idea white people coming and say, we admire you, we are so decadent, we destroy nature, you have holistic relationship to nature. They hate this so much, and I know a Native American guy, I love him, who wrote a book on, this is true fighting racism, who wrote a book on killing the buffaloes and claimed it's not the white, we Indians screwed it up, we killed more buffaloes than the white and so on and so on. It's crazy position, but you know what's his point? That the worst form of racism is if this patronizing elevation of the other as more authentic and so on and so on. So in this sense, I don't believe that that progress is with either we Europeans simply 
learning something from the third world, or I'm also against European racism, like in the sense that they should adopt European enlightenment, they will become civilized, and so on, and so on. It's more of a mess, to put it like this. Sorry, let's have the lady. Hi, um, my question is, if you are making a science fiction film, but interpret science fiction loosely, because obviously the problems are not gonna be solved with yeah. science alone, um, with like the most talented artists in the world, like what would be in that film in terms of like, I don't know, themes that people haven't explored enough or things that you haven't seen enough or like just anything you would wanna see in it? Well, that movie, I, I can already have an answer, not that I made it, but you know, the novel, it's much more complex, the story that I mentioned, this new 16 or whatever, uh, 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 the, uh, how do you call it, 3-3, three, three, I forgot the title, 3 Solaris, 3, yeah, yeah. You know, something mysterious is happening with that movie. They made a mega production in China. I already saw trailers and so on. All of a sudden, it disappeared. Okay, in China, things like this happen, you know. Uh, then, the rumor was that some big, not uh, uh, net, some big Western company, Amazon even, I think, they wanted to move into it, bought from a tremendous amount, half a billion of dollars, bought the copyright. But this was three, four years ago, again, nothing happened. And maybe, this is a good sign, you know, that there is something uh, so traumatic in that novel that uh, kind of uh, there is a resistance to it, to do it. But uh, to return to your question, I cannot give you, I don't have a, I'm too stupid. My imagination is not good enough to give you a simple question. I just tell you that that genre which was alive a couple of years ago, I don't think it goes on. What was that movie? I forgot the title, not so well-known actors. I think a woman directed it of a, uh, it's this, I like this simple science fiction movies, not Star Wars, whatever, but just something small, simple happens, like what was that one where you remember? A ship lands somewhere. Yeah, Arrival, yes. It's so modest, just, and. Uh, it's a modest movie, but I, I, I loved it immensely, you know. I like this, apparently, commercially, B-level movies, which are much more uh, uh, liberating in this sense, you know. But uh, I don't even know what's happening. And yes, uh, now to finish with something for which, again, you will hate me, it's politically maybe not even incorrect, just, in my circles, it's fashionable to despise it. Although it's stupid, simplified, inconsistent, but oh my God, it's so horrible. Uh, I, up to a point, I enjoyed, uh, uh, don't worry, darling, did you see it? <laughs> because I like this idea that uh, the world we live in is sustained by a dream, which is literally true. The way the world we live in is sustained by an ideological dream. And you know that, of course, all my sexist friends accuse me, oh, you want to screw Olivia Wilde, so you sublimate this into, <laughs> into you like. But no, no, there is another movie. Did you see it? Prisoners, I think. Some 10 years old series, which is based on another blah, blah, where they have similar situation, but with a wonderful detail. A guy, again, like here, awakens in a very strange, secluded universe. There is a city and uh, life goes on, life normal, but strange things happen. And then the solution is that they all live in a dream. There is a woman on Earth which has a, such strong dream ability and she, with her constant dreaming, sustained their world, sustained, but there is a wonderful detail. I like these details. All of a sudden, in this universe, it's again, as in Don't Worry Darling, it's desert and so on, gaps appear, like a big hole, all of a sudden, part of the, of the ground disappears, infinite hole, and the reading is that 
she has disturbed dream, you know, in its experience as. This is a very good metaphoric description, I claim, of our ideological, of our ideological situation. So I must say, uh, I like, I don't like, not because, no, I'm not a snob, the oh, space opera bad. No, they are simply more or less boring for me. And I even think my great disappointment in Star Wars is that the one that I was most looking forward to. What was part three, where uh, Anakin becomes Darth Vader? I all the time was intrigued into how they will stage this. They do it in a totally stupid wrong way because he is too much in love with uh, Natalie Portman or <laughs> whatever and so on. And then this, it, it, and then becomes uh, be, uh, like too attached to her and so on. No, my, okay, now I will tell you a dream which comes to me. My, it's madness. To reshoot Star Wars, but from the opposite Stalinist way. <laughs> Palpatine, the Emperor, and Darth Vader are good emancipatory, universalist, egalitarian dictators, and they fight some old feudalists, those disgusting creatures like Yoda who wants to mess with it and so on, you know, to reshoot it by celebrating the empire, you know. <laughs> I know that. that would be my ideal of that one. That's why I also liked the game of thrones. I think the ending, I was all the time on that, how was he called, Daenerys, the girl dictator. I think he was a progressive dictator, and at the end, it's very sad. She is liquidated, and you remember, it's, I think, consciously a sad ending. The new power circle gathers, and they said, ho oh, oh, ho, democracy, ho oh, oh, ho, what's this? And they, they decide the first to think is rebuild the army and the brothers and so on, you know. It's a very, it's not simply denouncing her as totalitarian and so on. I would, if I were to make that series, I would put a little bit more pressure on her being the good hardliner, you know. And they are kind of a, it's like Termidor, no? No, 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 I, 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 so I don't have big original idea. I just like to think in these terms, you know, how to change this, how to change that. But my basic tendency is you can, like, I'm not a snob, but through Sophie Fines, I know Ray Fines vaguely, the actor. And he plays the bad guy Voldemort in, uh, in uh, Harry Potter movies. And I told him, but the final movie where his gang, the bad guys, attacked that stupid castle where they, and they fail. And I said, I would reshoot it. He, Voldemort, is a good progressive people's leader, and they attack that magician castle as the ruling class <laughs> university and so on, you know. It didn't go well with him. <laughs> Because I gave to him another idea. You know, he now is uh, M in James Bond, no? And I said, I hoped so much that it will turn out that you are really a bad guy. Like maybe Blofeld's illegitimate son or whatever. That M, and he, he said, no, I'm tired of these roles of a pathological bad guys. I want to be finally a good guy. And I didn't tell him, but my idea was, ha ha, so you want to be like an, just another boring good guy. <laughs> That's what uh, awaits you, no? So again, along these lines, I like to see the ambiguities and to, I'm for a long time obsessed, I love this, with this idea of take a classical work of art and rewrite it with a different ending. For example, unfortunately, there are not many opera lovers here properly, but do you know P uh, Puccini Tosca? where at the end, uh, uh, you know, she thought that she bribed and up before killing him that Cavardos, uh, not cover yes. And then, uh, uh, and then she said, oh, 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 he is shot. 
he, see, he thinks, oh, he survived, and then he, noti he noticed with horror, he, her lover is really dead, so she jumps down. Alain Badiou gave me, and musically it could be done. There are long enough passages, this change, if you know the ending, like she lies dead and she, oh, Mario, Mario, and runs and jumps down, that uh, uh, she jumps towards the precipice that uh, Angel Castle to jump down, and then she moves, she says, no, no, Tosca, I was just kidding, I'm really alive, and then embrace, and you can use the same triumphant music which would have fit even better, you know. That's the limit of my creativity. I don't have strong enough enjoyment, uh, sorry, uh, uh, creative imagination, you know, to invent the whole, the entire new story. But on the other hand, I'm fortunately, my, maybe I'm really a secret totalitarian or what, I like this northern dark myth, you know, Nibelung, Beowulf, and so on. I don't like this Mediterranean too bright. I like the idea of everything ends bad, it's a nightmare, and so on. You know, I'm... I'm a, I'm a pessimist, you know why? Because the final moral lecture to you. We pessimists are really the only people who can be moderately happy. Because you are a total pessimist, and then fuck it, from time to time something happens which is not too bad. You get, well, if you are an optimist, you are basically all the time disappointed, I think, you know. So I'm a pessimist believing in miracles. Not supernatural miracles, but for, for example, look now at Iran, and so on and so on. Miracles happen, miracles only in this sense of political, of political miracles, no? Thanks very much, and I hope I...